It's day two of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Wow. Seeing how God is moving all across the earth is just, I I have no words. (laughs) I mean, I asked yesterday where you all were listening from, and we are in nearly every state of the U.S. Wait, let me take a look here where we are. Uh, Canada, Ireland, South Africa, the U.K., Portugal, Puerto Rico, Kenya, Turks and Caicos, Nassau, India, Philippines, Panama, Poland, Trinidad, American Samoa, Honduras, Mexico, Netherlands, Germany, Zambia, Barbados, Australia, New Zealand, Nigeria, China, Malawi, is that how I say that? Sri Lanka, Zimbabwe, Austria, Brazil, Estonia, Singapore, and even a rig in the North Sea incredible. And if I have missed you, I apologize. And if I didn't say where you're from, let us know where you are watching from in the comments below. But we are just so thrilled to know that God is reaching His arms all across the earth. And we just get to be a little part of that. Isn't that exciting? If I did name a place where you are watching from, hit that like button for us. That lets us know that you've come back for more and you are loving Bible study and getting into the word and diving a little bit deeper. Not because you like me and not because you like my channel, but because you like what we are doing. Now, a couple of things I wanted to address before we get into today's reading, because I always say that this is a Bible study and we are here to help each other learn. And so when I see a question or a comment that seems it needs a little bit more clarity, I am definitely going to address it because I think that's important. So the first comment that someone had was about my commentary regarding being fruitful and multiplying when God not only told the animals that, but he also told humans. And they were saying, well, I've always learned that that just simply meant have babies and populate the earth. And that absolutely is what God was saying. That was his plain and simple message to them. What I did was I went ahead and dug a little bit deeper into the meaning of what being fruitful actually means and why God would command that. When you think about the word fruit, and full, well, that brings to mind the fruit of the Spirit, and that's what we talked about. And so, in studying the Bible, we try to go a little bit deeper under the surface, not trying to take it out of context, and definitely not trying to bring a meaning that doesn't make sense, because that was the concern, that because it was a little bit too off of context, that I might confuse new believers. And I definitely don't want to do that, but I don't think that I was too far out of context by saying that being fruitful means to have have the fruit of the Spirit and to love and to increase in that love would mean casting out the evil. And that allows us to then apply the word that was spoken back then to our lives today. Because again, where does that leave people who can't have babies, right? Like what will that mean to them? But on the surface, it absolutely just means have babies populate the earth. Because of course he said it to the animals too, and the animals don't have the fruit of the Spirit, and so that meaning would not apply to them. So I love that. This is what it's about. We are in fellowship together. I'm a student with you. I love this kind of conversation. I think it's healthy and it is good. So I apologize if I caused any confusion whenever I spoke on that, and I appreciate the person who brought it to my attention. Now the second thing, I won't always address petty comments or criticism that I get. But when I feel that criticism is corrective, especially when it corrects me, I'm going to own up to it and I will take responsibility. So someone brought it to my attention that whenever I said that your spouse is not a pain in your, and I added a little bleep, I literally said beep whenever I filmed it, but I guess it was distasteful of me to even use that analogy at all because it doesn't glorify God. And the Bible does say, do not have any sort of coarse language or coarse joking. And so I think that that was definitely out of line for me. And so because of that, I will say that I'm sorry, not only because I may have offended somebody, but most of all, because it probably grieved the heart of God. And that is something that I never want to do. So I wanted to sincerely apologize and ask for your forgiveness on that. And thank you to the person who brought that up as well. Because again, this is what it's about. Community and fellowship is all about being able to mutually encourage one another. With that said, if you are here on day two, I wanted to ask this question. What is your hope or what is your goal 
for this Bible study this year? What are you wanting to get out of it? Where do you see yourself at the end of this year? Can you write that in the comments below? Because I think that that will help to encourage other people who are here saying, I'm not really sure what I'm trying to get out of this. I'm not really sure where I'm beginning. And maybe even for those who did this last year, let us know what it did for you so that you can then tell other people, hey, this definitely helped me being in the Word 365 days. And this is what it did for my life. And I believe that it will happen for you as well. So not what you liked about me, but what you loved about being in the Word faithfully. Otherwise, please make sure you're subscribed to the channel, to the podcast. You've hit the notification bell. And as always, join us in our Facebook group if you want to continue the conversation or join one of our discussion groups that are online. Everything else that you need, you can either find it in the show notes or the description box or head on over to our website, heartdive.org. Otherwise, we are covering Genesis chapters four through seven today. So let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we love you. Thank you. Thank you for being such a good father to us, someone who loves us so much that you simply do not want to leave us in our junk and you do not want us to remain the way we are, but you want us to change for the better. And so we receive that today and we open ourselves up to that as we open your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will be here with us, in the midst of us, dwelling within, that our eyes, ears, and hearts will be open to your word. And I just pray that you will minister so clearly to us. Silence all distractions, Lord. May this time with you be holy and be effective, a tool for our growth. And I pray more than anything, Lord, we will draw closer to you because that is what this is all about. It is to develop our relationship with you because ultimately that's what you want. Forgive us, Lord, where we have erred. Forgive us where we have spoken out of turn. Forgive us, Lord, where we have had evil thoughts. Forgive us where we have said something against somebody that was hurtful. Forgive us, Lord, where we have stepped over the line or where we have fallen short. I pray that you will help us to also forgive those who have hurt us as well. And we know that as we try to draw nearer to you, Lord, the enemy is going to be crouching at our door, trying to get into our lives. And so I just pray that you'll keep him out, Lord. Shut the door on him. Do not let him in. We thank you for allowing us to be under your safety, you as our refuge, under the shadow of your wings. We love you so much. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we left off yesterday with Adam and Eve being kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and now we're going to see what their life is like outside in the world. Chapter four. Now, Adam knew his Eve, his wife. That means he was intimate with her. And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now, Cain's name means craftsman or metal worker or I have acquired. And by the way, we will see lots of meanings for names today. And this is one of the resources that I like to use. I know people like to know what my resources are. This is called All the Names of the Bible. It is by Thomas Nelson. Really great book, great resource to have. So you can find this linked in my Amazon link in the show notes or the description box if that is something you want to check out. Otherwise, I also got some of these meanings of these names in the sources that I use, including my study Bible and some of the commentaries, in case you were wondering. And again, she bore his brother, Abel. Now, Abel's name actually either means vapor or empty. And that makes sense because, of course, his life is cut short. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, a worker of the ground. So these two jobs that they had did not actually reflect their character in any way. It was just their differences. Now, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. So he brought the best in faith, according to Hebrews. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Now, some people will ask the question, why didn't God receive Cain's offering? Was it simply because he only brought fruit of the ground and he didn't kill an animal? Well, we know that God later on receives sacrifices, both animal sacrifices, but also offerings that are not animal related. And so that can't be the reason why he was upset with Cain. We find out later that Abel's was brought with faith. And so we can only assume that Cain's was not. And it's definitely reflected in his character and the way that he reacts a little bit later on, that there was some sort of deficiency in his character whenever he brought this offering. So 
So he's clearly upset. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? So the way that you react to rejection will oftentimes tell a lot about what's going on within you. If you are rejected and you're able to kind of have some introspective moments and be at peace with that, or maybe you can think about it for a little bit, then you're probably doing all right. But if you immediately react with anger or jealousy or bitterness, then there's probably something a little bit deeper rooted within. And that is what was happening with Cain here. Now, if you do well, this is God continuing to speak, will you not be accepted? So he obviously didn't do well. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you. Remember, we were talking about this word desire and how it is to rule over. So sin's desire is to rule over Cain, but you must rule over it. So here we see God having so much grace on Cain. And instead of scolding him right there, God actually asks him questions that he clearly knows the answers to, right? But asking questions always offers that chance for introspection. And so God was hoping that Cain would be able to see what was going on within himself. Knowing full well what Cain had the potential of doing, God warns him in grace, giving him a way out. And the Bible says that God will never allow a temptation that is going to overtake us. He will always provide that way out. So he's letting him know, listen, sin is crouching at your door, just as it is with us constantly. And I hope that you have verse seven underlined here where it says, you must rule over it. Because if you don't, sin will rule over you. So heart check, what is crouching at your door? Do you see the escape hatch? And what steps do you need to take in order to rule over it? Now, of course, that's going to look different for everyone. You know, there are addictions, there's anger, jealousy, and bitterness like we see in Cain here. Someone dropping in your DMs or maybe being in a relationship you shouldn't be in. I don't know what it looks like, but we all have authority over it, no matter what it is, even for mindsets, even for depression, even for mental instability. So with the power of the Holy Spirit, we are more than conquerors and we are able to overcome. Verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? Again, he knows where his brother is, but he asks him anyway. And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And I was like, man, for a guy who just committed murder and having the ability to talk to God that way, again, character flaws, big time. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Now, this blood crying out is crying out in condemnation and judgment and accusation. Contrary, very different from the blood of Jesus that offers forgiveness over that sin. So, this is the first murder that we see in the Bible. Verse 11, and now you are cursed. Here is the third curse, but the first curse given to a human. You are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth." So Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. So he doesn't have any repentance here. He is more sorrowful over the punishment and not so much over his sin or the sin itself. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. So he's sitting over here saying, it's not fair. Then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So this word Nod is a wordplay on the word wandering or vagabond. So he gives him this mark of protection. And we too have that same kind of mark. We are marked by the blood out of the hands of Satan. He is not allowed to touch us. He can intimidate us. He can try to put fear into us, but he cannot touch you. And Cain knew his wife, so he was intimate with her. And people are saying, who's his wife? Well, there was some incest going on in these days, obviously, but the genetic pool wasn't polluted yet. And so we will see this population growth because it was necessary. I mean, how else are they going to have babies unless it's all immaculate conception? So he knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. Now his name 
means dedicated one. And when he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. So we are seeing here this rapid population growth, the beginning of industrialism or urbanization, and very man-centered, the fact that he is naming the city after his son, Enoch. Now to Enoch was born Erad, and Erad fathered Mehujael, and Mehujael fathered Methushiel, and Methushiel fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. So here we see the beginning of polygamy, which is very subversive of God's original plan of just one woman and one man. And then, of course, from this, we'll see all sorts of other problems start to take place. So the name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zilla. Now, I do have the meanings of other people's names here, but the two that I want to look at right now is Ada and Zilla. So Ada's name means ornament or beauty, and then Zilla's name means seductress, shabbiness, or shadow, which the interesting thing here is that whenever he has two wives, well, of course, one of them is going to be more beautiful and the other one is going to fall into the shadow. And that's the danger of even having an affair or starting to entertain even an emotional affair because what's going to happen is you will start to have more feelings for this person and then your spouse or whoever else is going to fall into the shadows. And that's where we start to see, I just don't have feelings for that person anymore or I've fallen out of love with them. And this is a really rare mention of women in the Bible. And anytime there's a mention of women, you have to ask yourself, why? What was the purpose? And so for this, I'm thinking it was probably to point to the effects of polygamy and affairs and consider the meaning of their names. Now, Ada bore Jabel, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all of those who play the lyre and pipe. So here we see the beginning of entrepreneurialism and music becoming a career instead of music for worship only. Zilla also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. Otherwise, he made weapons. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. So it's pretty interesting that all of these things are rooted in Cain. And Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's revenge is 77-fold, which basically is 70 times seven. So he is inflating numbers here, the same way that he is inflating his own ego. So this Lamech here represents arrogance and vengeance and violence, but the plot twist here is that we never hear from this Lamech again. We'll hear from another Lamech in chapter five, but that is not the same Lamech that we're hearing from. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed, so that's what Seth's name means, is appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel. For Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So in a sense, this is the first revival we are seeing or the first spiritual resurgence and calling upon the name of the Lord is not actually praying, which some people would think, but it is making proclamation. So this is the beginning of preaching and ministering and evangelizing. Now, what I find interesting here is that when we hear the story of Cain and Abel when we were little kids, we're just focused on Cain and Abel and the act of murder itself. But I think the superstar of this story is actually Seth. He took the place of Abel. I'm sure that Eve was just hoping, or like any good parent, you just hope that your kids are so successful. And she probably saw most of that hope in Abel. And so now Seth is born. And of course, we know that from Seth's line will come Christ, and from Christ will come us, the bride or the church as Christians. And we'll see how all of that takes place here in chapter 5. Chapter five, this is the book of the generations of Adam. We're going to stop here for a second because some scholars actually believe that Adam actually may have accounted for the first four chapters of Genesis and then handed it down, eventually getting it into the hands of Moses, who actually penned the rest of Genesis, which is why we sort of see this recap and genealogy account in chapter five. Now, when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. 
Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. Now, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Now, notice that Cain and Abel were not mentioned in the beginning of this genealogy account, and that is the whole thing with genealogy, especially here. We're not going to see every single person named. The intention of genealogy is to be able to show us the connection, to give us the major players so that we know how everything connected in history. Now, when Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Now, through these next few verses, we are going to see the same sort of formula throughout, so don't get too bored. We're going to come back to the meanings of their names, and it's a pretty interesting thing to take a look at. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 840 years and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Kenan were 910 years and he died. Now, when Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years and he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Now, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God. Whoa, here's a little bit of a twist in the formula. After he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Years. So quite a bit shorter than everybody else, about a third of their lives. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Okay, whoa, we got to stop here on this guy, Enoch. What is going on here? So let's look. Enoch, he walked with God, just as Adam and Eve did before the fall. He was one of only two be the other one being Elijah, who were raptured or essentially taken without dying here on this earth. It introduces the life after death in the presence of God, and it also gives a testimony to his faith because he lived to please God. And we'll read about this more later. Now, this doesn't mean that he was sinless because we know that Jesus was the only one who walked the earth and was without sin but he was still righteous in the way that he walked. And when we look at different ways that the Bible talks about how we walk, we walk by faith, we walk in light, and we walk in in agreement with God. And Enoch, according to Hebrews, definitely walked by faith. So, this is the first mention of a rapture in the Bible. And what is this term here that says he was not? That doesn't mean that he didn't have life. It just simply means that he didn't die like the rest and he was taken up. But I love to look at this and compare it to the fact that God is the I am and we are not. He is everything that we need. From him comes all things. And that is why we worship him. Now, when Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. So remember, I was just saying there's another Lamech in the Bible. So different from the Lamech in chapter four. Now, Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. And thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. So this recording right here is the longest life in the Bible. 969 years is the longest someone was recorded living. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying out of the ground that the Lord has cursed. This one shall bring us relief or comfort or rest from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. So I'm going to stop here for a moment because we're looking at this genealogy of chapter five. Most of us would skim over this chapter and hear what want, what want, what want, right? But let's take a look at the significance of the meanings of these people's names, because in this one chapter here that we would normally hear the wah, 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 we get the entire gospel message out of the names of these people, the major players. So first here, looking at Adam, Adam's name literally means man. Seth means placed or appointed. Enosh, mortal. Kynan, sorrow. Mahalalel, blessed God. Jared shall come down. Enoch, 
teaching or anointed, Methuselah, his death will bring, Lamech, despairing or taste, and Noah, rest and comfort. And so when you just look at this in order, a man who was placed and appointed by God, of course, who came to be a mortal, even through sorrow, he still blessed God and he knew he had to come down as the anointed one, as the teacher, knowing that his death would bring a despairing taste, but would ultimately bring us rest and comfort. Isn't that incredible? That just brought goosebumps. I don't think that that is a coincidence, that that is what all of their names meant. Can anybody hear the garbage man outside? <laughs> I swear the garbage man always comes whenever I'm recording. Verse 30, Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And we will see his generation spelled out in chapter six. Now, before we start chapter six, I do want to give us a little bit of context because plenty of years have gone by. We see the genealogy. So that means generations have passed. So if we just look at what the population probably looks like in the days of Noah, well, if you consider that just one man would probably have four kids and multiply that by five generations that he would probably see in his lifetime, well, that would be about 96 kids. Now, if you look at 10 generations, that would then exponentially grow to 3,000, 20 generations would be 3.12 million, 30 generations would be 3.2 billion. And by looking at Genesis 5, we're looking at 40 years of 40 generations, which means billions and billions of people on the earth during the days of Noah. That's pretty incredible to think about because I think growing up listening to these stories, I thought there might've been like a couple hundred people on the earth, but it was highly populated. And in any sociological study that you look at, high populations oftentimes have negative impacts or negative implications. Many times that being sexual immorality and we even see it weaved throughout the Bible. And even today, as our population continues to boom, just looking at that alone, and you might wanna close some little ears right now if there's some listening, the porn industry is $100 billion. I've seen other estimates that were double that. The sex trade industry, $180 billion and only increasing. This is staggering to think about. So when the Bible talks about in the New Testament, as the days of Noah regarding the judgment that is to come, these are some of the things that show that they're ripe for judgment. They're eating, they're drinking, they're marrying, and that's very much so the life we are seeing today. So starting off here in verse one, when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. Who are the sons of God? This is highly debated, but most scholars fall into the category of saying that these are the fallen angels, the ones we spoke of that fell from heaven, the third of the angels that were now on the earth and have taken on a human form. And they took as their wives any that they chose. So we hear in Jude 6 about the sons of God who left their proper domain. Well, the proper domain of angels is definitely not cohabitating or marrying women. They are not supposed to marry. Angels are not anyway. And this breaches God's monumental order. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh and his days shall be 120 years. Other translations say, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, meaning he's not going to put up with this. There will be an end to it. And there are two ways of looking at this 120 years. Some people say, well, that means that the lifespan of a human is going to be reduced to 120 years, which is oftentimes what I thought that that meant. But actually, they are looking now that it means that they are going to be given an additional 120 years, sort of like a grace period to be able to repent before God brings his judgment upon the earth. And again, he is saying, my spirit will not be here forever. Time will be up. The buzzer's going to sound. Now, the Nephilim, whoa, who's the Nephilim? These are known as the giants. These are the offspring of the angels or the sons of God and the humans were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So when you think of the most famous giant, of course, that being David and Goliath. Now the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So basically every aspect of man was corrupt. 
And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Now, a lot of people will look at this and say, wait, what? So God made a mistake? Well, that's not what it is saying because when we look at the term regretted, it actually means that he was sorry or he was sorrowful. So this is what is known as anthropopathic language, which shows that God actually has human emotions. He's got a soul. He's got feelings. And this continual evil is grieving his heart. It is hurting him. So it does not mean that he made a mistake or that he wished that he didn't actually make man. It just means that he had high expectations and it is hurting him just like it would any parent to have high expectations for their child and see them fail. But you never say as a parent, I sure wish I didn't have that kid. You still love them. So that's not what God was saying. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry or sorrowful that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And I was like, thank you, Noah, but Noah, hashtag, but Noah. So when we look at this word favor here, this word is actually charis or charis, which means grace. Grace is that undeserved, unearned favor of God that he freely gives to us. It is a gift. It is always available. And when you hear about the word grace in the Bible, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. So the amount of sin that is going on on the earth at this time, there is even more grace that is able to cover that. Verse nine, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man and he was blameless. So these two words, righteous and blameless, basically mean he had a genuine righteousness in his generation. And Noah walked with God and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So they lay the foundation for humanity after the flood. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. So we see what's going on because of this population boom here. We've got sexual perversion, demonic activity, constant evil, corruption, and violence, which is widespread. And God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So every single person now corrupt. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, mind you, he is letting them know that this is going to happen. So that is his mercy. That is his grace. And yet people still aren't listening. Listening. Make yourself an ark. This word literally means box of gopher wood. Now, we don't actually know what type of wood gopher is. Some people say it's cypress, but this word gopher is likely transliterated from the Hebrew language, and that's where we got the word gopher. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is probably some sort of petroleum product that helped to make this waterproof. And this is how you are to make it the length of the ark. 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Now, a cubit is about 18 inches. And so this makes it 450 feet in length. So one and a half football fields, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet in height. Make a roof for the ark or like a sunroof, kind of like a skylight. And this would allow for circulation and light to come in and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark on its side. So the door, there's only one way in and one way out, just like salvation, right? I mean, if you think about the ark and what it signifies, this was the ark of safety. This was God saving a remnant from the judgment just the same way that God saves us from judgment by the way of Jesus coming to die for us. And so he is our ark of safety. And there's only one door in. Jesus is the only door. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Now, there is no indication that Noah lived anywhere near a body of water that would require a ship of this size, let alone a weather report. You know, they didn't have the weather channel back then of some sort of impending storm that was coming in, meaning that he's probably looking a little cuckoo at this point, right? Yet it did not even phase him to follow the command of God to work outside the box. And God will often do that whenever he calls us to greater things. So heart check, are you willing to work outside the box if and when God calls you?
Verse 18, but anytime we've got these words, but nor therefore, we always got to stop and think, what is the meaning of this? So he is pronouncing his judgment. And then there's some hope here, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife and your son's wives with you. God is all about always saving a remnant here. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. And of the birds according to their kinds, and of all the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing on the ground, according to its kind, two of every sort shall come in to you to keep them alive. So I just thought, man, are these just baby animals? Because there are some big animals. How are they all going to realistically fit into this boat? So probably babies. That's what I'm thinking. Also, take with you every sort of food that is eaten and stored up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. So he didn't complain. He just got to work. Chapter seven. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all of your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Now, remember, being righteous doesn't mean without sin, but it means that you are walking with God. You are living to please him just the way that Enoch was. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals. Why seven pairs? Well, these were likely to be for the animal sacrifices as well as for food. And the male and his mate and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens, also male and female to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days, I will send rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So this number 40 is significant because this often signifies the fullness of time or it signifies judgment, trials, and difficulty. And every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Now, Noah was 600 years old when the flood of the waters came upon the earth. So he was working on this ark for like a hundred years. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him and went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. And I just love this because it just goes to show that God loves families. And that is again, why the enemy wants to tear down break down families of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of every thing that creeps on the ground. Two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. So all of the oceans, all of the rivers, everything came up and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now, some scholars say this is actually that canopy of water that burst forth onto the earth. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kinds and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered male and female of all flesh went in as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. So this shutting him in signifies closure and safety and deliverance, just the same way that whenever we receive Jesus as our Savior, our salvation is sealed. We are then shut into heaven in a sense. The only way we can really get out is if we walk out the door. So get on the boat, get on the ark, don't walk out. Whenever we get on the ark of safety, whenever we get on the boat of faith, your family will follow you when they start to see a change in your heart, a change in your disposition, a change in your character. They're going to want to be around you, but not only around you, but whatever it is that is bringing this change. I've seen it happen time and time again. Now the flood continued 40 days on the earth and the waters increased and bore up the ark and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed. So this word here means they were strong and they were mighty and they increased greatly on the earth and the ark floated on the face of the waters and the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. So the waters were literally over the entire earth, covering all of the mountains. So this wasn't just a little localized flood. I mean, the entire earth underwater. And the waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind." 
everything on the dry land and whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and the birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Now, I know when you don't have a really good understanding of who God is, this can sound like a really gory story and very hard to even understand why a loving God would do this. Why would he wipe out everyone on the earth? But if you really just try to take on his heart and you try to understand his mind and how loving and kind he is, and when he sees his children just destroying themselves from the inside out, he is saying, we need to redo. We need to start over. We've got to wipe the slate clean. So this is actually his mercy to try to wipe the earth clean and give mankind another chance to get it right. But sadly, we see that we aren't getting it right. And in fact, the Bible tells us that we aren't going to get it right and therefore we need a savior. And we don't need him to just come here once. We need him to come back again and completely make things right, which we will have a complete understanding of by the end of this year and by the end of reading the Bible. So we just thank you so much, Lord, for showing us today the importance of living righteously before you, walking with you, living to please you, not trying to please ourselves. For when we do so, God, we know that we will come as a living and pleasing sacrifice to you, just as Abel brought his sacrifice that honored you. So help us, Lord, to have the right attitude when we come into your presence. May we rid ourselves of any anger or jealousy or bitterness or dissension so that we don't place ourselves in a position where we will dishonor our brothers and our sisters, but even more so, God, we don't wanna dishonor you. We know that hatred for one another is equated to murder in your eyes. So may we be a people who are quick to forgive and quick to love. Thank you, Lord, for your continued mercy and favor that is always available to us. And I thank you for always giving us a chance to get things right, just as you did with Cain and just as you did with the people during the days of Noah. Thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of our mess ups, you still put a mark on us that keeps us safe in your arms. So we desire, Lord, to walk with you just as Enoch and Noah did, knowing that you are the great I am and we are not. We never, Lord, want to grieve your heart. So I pray that we will always honor the covenant that you have made with us, knowing that it is a binding oath, a binding promise. And I pray that we will never walk away from it, but always remain in the ark of safety. Please help us, Lord, to be hard workers who don't complain, but simply have a desire to do all that you command. We love you so much, Lord. Thank you for this word today. I pray that you bless every person here. In the name of Jesus, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short. And then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I wanna be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna end up after I die, but I don't wanna live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're gonna say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven, of all my sins. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.